Today we begin the season of Lent. While this season has traditionally been known as one for repentance and penance, the liturgical readings for the Sundays of Lent would suggest that there's another theme that is primary, and that theme is the mercy of God, the loving kindness and mercy of God. The first reading is taken from Genesis. It's made up of several different episodes, the creation of the man, uh, the putting him in the garden, um, then the uh, a section from Genesis 3 where we have the temptation of the woman and then the sin of both the man and the woman. Now the section of the temptation, which seems to be the primary focus because the gospel reading is the temptation of Jesus. And liturgically, it is usually the, the Sunday reading of, from the gospel that sets the primary tone of all the other readings, or at least the theme for that day. So we're going to concentrate on the temptation. Some have claimed that the woman is tempted because women are more gullible and that they are not so astute in being able to discern when they're being tempted. Uh, there, there's nothing in the biblical text that suggests this. This is just a biased, misogynistic interpretation of the text. And certainly, if we have in the gospel the temptation of Jesus, one cannot say that women are any more gullible than men are. I'm not suggesting that Jesus is gullible, but we certainly have in the gospel a story of a man being tempted, not a woman being tempted. Going back to the God, uh, first reading, some would counter the male preferred interpretation or the biased interpretation that the women are gullible and that's why Eve was tempted and would say that really it's just the opposite. That rather she was in dialogue with the serpent because women are natural theologians, which is just as sexist as the reverse is. So why was it the woman and not the man that was tempted? If we look carefully at the first reading in Genesis, we see many themes that belong to the wisdom tradition. First of all, the, the snake is described as being cunning. The object of temptation is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Both of these are very definitely wisdom themes. Then the, the question of the temptation really has to do with making a decision, which certainly is a wisdom theme. And then what we find in the early traditions of ancient Israel is wisdom is personified as a woman. So the Genesis temptation story is really a story about wisdom that still doesn't answer the question, why is wisdom personified as a woman in the other passages we find in Proverbs, we find this in the Book of Wisdom itself, and in the Book of Sirach. Certainly the ancestors of ancient Israel worshipped a goddess of wisdom. But again, why? Why is wisdom associated with women? Most scholars today would suggest, and it's only a suggestion because there's no evidence in biblical material or other ancient Near Eastern material, they would suggest that wisdom was the greatest treasure that was desired in the ancient world. And in a patriarchal, male-focused society, what was most treasured would naturally be personified as a woman. That's as close as we can get to trying to understand why wisdom was a woman and why perhaps the woman in the Genesis story is a kind of shadow or at least a suggestion of the woman, wisdom woman that we find in earlier texts. So we have the temptation. As with all temptations, it's very subtle. Real temptation is a desire for something good, not something evil, a desire for something good. What makes it a temptation is a good we have no right to, or a good we might have a right to, but we have no right to try to get it the way we want to get it. And that's what we find in the Genesis temptation story. They were told by the serpent, not a lie, 
the serpent or the, the snake told them, when you eat of the fruit, you will know good from evil. And that's exactly what happened, but not the way they thought it was going to happen, which frequently is what happens after we succumb to temptation. We get what we thought we wanted, but it's not exactly the way we wanted it, or it's not exactly what we wanted. So were they deceived? Well, the serpent was cunning. The serpent played on, the story says, on her desire, but both the man and the woman succumbed to the temptation. Now that's the first story. There's no indication there of mercy, not in the passage itself. In other places of the Genesis story, yes, but not this particular passage. We go then to the uh, uh, temptation of Jesus. And we see the temptation of Jesus, similarities but significant differences. In that temptation, there's no subtlety. The devil comes right out directly and tempts him. Do this and this will happen. Again, what will happen is a good. But Jesus does not succumb to the desire to achieve that good in a way that would be inappropriate for him. He did not choose to show his power, which he had. He didn't choose to use his power in order to be flamboyant, in, in order to enhance his own status, but rather he used his power, as we find in all of the Gospels, for the sake of others. So it was a direct temptation. And he did not succumb to the temptation in the same way as the man and the woman would succumb to the temptation. It's probably in the responsorial psalm that we really find the primary theme for this particular day, this Sunday, and as I said earlier, setting the tone for all of the Sundays of Lent. It's a passage from Psalm 51, and it begins in this way. Have mercy on me, God, in accord with your merciful love. In your abundant compassion, blot out my transgressions. There's an acknowledgement of sinfulness, transgressions, and a desire for mercy because we realize we need the mercy because of our transgressions. In that particular passage, there are two very technical covenant terms. The first term is trans translated merciful love. In other translations, it's called steadfast love. It is the very profound Hebrew word chesed. Chesed is the kind of love that says, there is nothing that you can do that will make me stop loving you. There is nothing that you can do that will make me stop loving you. That's the kind of love God has for sinful people. And the other word, compassion, comes from the Hebrew word for womb, rachamim, compassionate, comes from the Hebrew word for womb. So one could then say that compassion is really womb love, a very strong feminine image because the relationship between the mother, a woman, and the child in her womb is probably the most intimate, certainly physical, relationship that the human being can ever experience. And these two characteristics, covenant characteristics, steadfast or merciful love and womb love are sentiments that God has for us, not that we have for God. We do not have, at least in the biblical tradition, we do not respond to God's love in the same way as God loves us. So very strong words, and again, these words set the stage for the whole question of mercy. Though we have the temptation story, the response to the temptation story in the responsorial psalm is the mercy of God. So we look then at this first Sunday, and we discover it's appropriate for us to think about temptation. But the first thing we should think about is the goodness of God, the steadfast love of God. There is nothing that you can do that will make me stop loving you. And the compassion of God, the kind of intimate relationship 
and love and attentiveness that God has for the children of God's womb.